Let's give the Lord a hand praise. God bless you, Brother Morgan. Glory. Right. Hallelujah. Oh, my. I'm going to ask that nobody get too close to me on the platform tonight. I uh, had trouble finding a flight in. Put me in the back of the plane. I looked up and seen one of the biggest men in my life coming down the aisle. And I have this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. <laughs> All right. He walked past me to the next to the last row, sat down behind me. I said, Whoo. down the aisle come a little oriental girl. She got to uh, where I was sitting and I thought, man, that's a lot better than him. Lord have mercy. I don't know what I would have done. And then all of a sudden I heard her say, excuse me, sir, but I think you have my seat. And she said, where are you supposed to be sitting? He said, in 31F. <laughs> and I said, oh, Lord. Lord, I, 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 I flew into Austin like this. <laughs> So if I get a little funny over on my right side, don't <laughs> think about it. Amen. But it's good to be back in Austin tonight. Amen. And uh, I hope the stewardess uh, shows up. She said she'd either try to come tonight or tomorrow night. A little black stewardess walked up to me. She said, I've seen you somewhere before. I said, well, I fly American quite a bit. She said, no, not, not just on one of these flights. She said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, uh, yeah. She said, Pentecostal. I said, yes, I've seen you before. I said, you ever been in service with us? She said, no, I've seen you on TV. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she said, you preach on TV, don't you? And I said, well, the only way I would have been on TV is if somebody videoed me somewhere preaching, which I don't think they did, but... Uh, anyway, most of the churches I preach, you know, I don't have to worry about that. Thank God. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. Right. And uh, anyhow, I uh, I said, unless they did that and put it on TV without me being aware of it, that'd be about the only way. She said, well, I've seen you somewhere. I know that. She said, are you going to Austin? I said, yeah. She said, preaching? I said, yeah. She said, well, where are you going? I said, Austin Tabernacle. She said, by the airport. I said, by the airport. She said, I'll do my best to show up on the two nights that you're there. Amen. So I'm believing the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Bring her and fill her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All right. Glory. Amen. Praise God. Well, I, uh, I'm for the Sykes, in case I don't see you after service, uh, Brother Harmon told me to tell you hello. Oh, yeah, well, actually, he didn't say much. He would think it was his wife. Amen. <laughs> Glory. Amen. She said, that ain't right. You need a, a suitcase to put me in. I said, in your condition, would have to have a tuba case. <laughs> Amen. Glory. Well, the Lord is good. Oh, God. I'm telling you, he's good. I feel so, so right being here. One of the hardest things that God is dealing with among the church is the fact that sometimes we are so programmed by our traditions. We grow up in certain parts of the country, we do certain things certain ways. We are products of our environment and our mentality begins to develop particular patterns. And then all of a sudden the Holy Ghost breaks in on us in manners and ways that we're not patterned for. Amen. And if we're not careful because of our traditional concepts, we begin to try to reason what God is doing. And if we're not careful, we'll reason ourselves out 
of the promises of God. It didn't make sense, and it was beyond reason that Abraham would leave a prosperous, idolatry shop. His father was a maker of idols. He was a very prosperous man. It didn't make sense that he'd leave that environment and go look for a city that he didn't know anything about doesn't make sense but yet when God looked at him he said I'll give you a clue these are people that I am not ashamed to be called their God I preached last night when God is not ashamed I said somehow in the end time we've got to learn regardless if it doesn't make a bit of sense we've got to learn to follow the beckoning and the leading of the Holy Ghost even to the point that it breaks our particular concepts somebody needs to hear me tonight in the Holy Ghost we've got to understand when they first told me brother Clark was going to Las Vegas I said that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life how can a man do that and I'm telling you as soon as I thought it the Holy Ghost rebuked me he said not only will he go he'll succeed not only will he succeed, but you're going to help him. Amen. Glory. God is doing unusual things. And see, where we're having trouble is, we're having trouble because, now we've done it this way for 50 years in Pentecost, so. Come on. Come on. How? How can this be? If God would open the windows of the heaven, how could this thing be? It doesn't fit into our reasoning. Mighty God, mighty God. All that God needed was somebody to prove his preacher right. Hello. He tried to get somebody in there to believe, but he finally had to reach out and find four old lepers. <laughs> He said, I'm going to prove the man of God right. He's my man. It's my word. I'm going to prove him right. Now, I'm telling you, if we Pentecostals don't get with the program to prove God right, if he has to, he'll reach right outside the confines of the church and find him some old sinners and clean them up and give them a revelation and send them to do his job. You've got to quit reasoning. You've got to, I'm talking to this church, you've got to quit reasoning things. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Well, it don't make sense. Since when did faith make sense? I mean, looking for a city that you've never seen, leaving all the success and the prosperity behind. That doesn't make sense to me, but he did it. And God looked down and said, I am not ashamed to be called that man's God. That's right. Because when I say turn left, he turns left. Turn right, he turns right. Go forward, he goes forward. That's the kind of people God's looking for. Ooh, I wonder what we'd do if God told us to leave all of our financial securities, all of our family, all of our friends, and just go follow him. Your family look at you and say, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. They announced... Uh, uh, the charismatic society there in Tulsa they have a young man that they're promoting very heavily here on the radio especially in the Tulsa area and uh, his last name is Coors he was the direct descendant of the founder of the Coors Brewery and Bottling Company the young man was worth mega bucks hello I'm fixing to nail something right here mega bucks and quote unquote because he accepted Jesus Christ in a charismatic altar one night confessed him as his Lord went home told his father and all of them I cannot accept my inheritance turned his back on all of it we got people get 30,000 20,000 500 And it's like trying to, oh God, I hit it right there. Come on now. Like, 
You know, please, will you give it to God? Please, pretty please. If we make you all these promises, will you give it to God? And here's a young man that turns his back on multi-million dollar business and doesn't even have the truth. My God. Traveling to preach the gospel. And here we sit. Somehow we've got to get this gospel out. Boy, we got quiet on that one. You've got to change your concept about things. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be willing to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost regardless of how idiotic or suicidal it appears. He told me I was crazy for going to Oklahoma. So you're committing spiritual suicide to go there. So well, I know that. But that's where God said go. My friends told me, said, you're, you're crazy, you're crazy. You're taking a church that's had nothing but trouble. I said, well, when God says go, you go. You don't sit there and question it. Well, I may need to preach on that tomorrow night, amen. Well, I'm not going to preach real, real long tonight. Amen. Romans chapter 12. The Lord is going to speak to this church tonight. Lord Jesus. The Lord is going to speak to this church tonight. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Seems kind of unusual he'd say that, doesn't it? Give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We could go Saturday night, the Lord, uh, matter of fact, I'd taken Brother Sister Clark back to the airport after they were such a tremendous blessing to us there in Okmulgee. If y'all ever decide to get rid of them, just send them up there, we'll take good care of them. And uh, I don't think I got much to worry about. That's how come I can afford to say that. <laughs> and uh, got back and uh, called Brother Harmon. I said, I'm going down to the church if you'd like to go pray with me. And so we went down. It was a little late and got to praying. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't one of those earthquaking prayer meetings. But toward the end of it, 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 it just felt the presence of God in a peaceful manner. And then right at the end of it, See, I've learned a little secret about prayer. It's not me going into my Santa Claus list and just telling God. It's learning to wait and to listen for God to speak back. And so I just was waiting on the Lord, and when He spoke it to me, I, I, if if I could have done cartwheels, I think I would have. I, I got home. I pulled up the driveway. I didn't even want to go in the house. I didn't want to break it. So I just walked around the yard. Man, if they'd have seen me, I they'd probably thought I was crazy. Just walking around the yard, just staring, looking into the heavens. And uh, there, were, there were three churches that God told me specifically it would happen in. Okmulgee, Houston, and Austin. And... Uh, Man, I felt so thrilled. I said, all right, Lord, I believe your word. I'm preaching tonight on the subject, when the avenger arrives. When the avenger arrives, just make place for God's wrath. Praise God. Now, I know Brother Clark would already be going 90 miles an hour. But I'm, I'm going to take my time and preach like I preach. And uh, I, I, I got, uh, I just, I just feel like I need to say something tonight. And, and uh, God's fixing to confirm something to this church. It's going to blow your minds. Amen. When the avenger arrives. Let's give him praise one more time, shall we? Praise God. I love you, Jesus. I praise your mighty name. 
In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, Lord. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's clap to the Lord before you're seated tonight. Amen. And somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody lift your voice as loud as you can and give him praise right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Mm -mm. You may be seated. Amen. Pentecostal people are sometimes funny people. We put premiums on talking in tongues, running the aisles shouting but when you get down sometimes to Christian character they get just a little quiet on you amen when you start reading such statements as you will find prior to the 19th verse of this 12th chapter of Romans it says recompense to no man evil for evil he says, in other words, don't, don't think that because somebody says something smart to you, you got to say something smart back to them. I was driving up the highway the other day to pick Brother Bourne up at the airport, and I don't know where this girl come from. She's driving a car and looked like another lady's in there. And I was in the left lane, just minding my own business, and this woman comes pulling right out in front of me. And... Uh, I I, uh, I thought, well, you know, there's two lanes here. I think, if I remember correct, the left lane is the passing lane. Of course, the Oklahoma people have a hard time understanding that. It's the only state I know that they get in the left lane and drive 45 mile an hour. And then when you pass them, they look at you like you've offended them. Amen. And... Uh, so anyway, I, I, I thought, well, surely she'll. So I decided, well, I'll go around her. When I tried to go around her, she'd speed up. And then when I'd get in behind her, and, and slowly but surely, I felt this, this simmering in my spirit. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to be nice here. There may be someone sane up there. I'd hate to be preaching somewhere. And uh, then come up to their pastor and say, that's the man that beat me up. <laughs> so I, 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 I blinked my lights a couple times and I thought maybe she having trouble seeing me. And uh, finally she pulled over to the right and I started up beside her. And when I did, she flipped me off. I thought, now what kind of an idiotic person, a woman, flipping me off, I ought to pull over and slap her. I thought, now she's got a lot of brains. I mean, I, 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 I could be some criminal. I could be some madman. And she's flipping me off, acting like that. And, 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 and this, this devil got a hold of my steering wheel and was trying to ram her in the side. And, 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 and I, was, I was fighting the spiritual battle of my life at that point because I, I was just mad. And thanks be unto God. 
<laughs> but I, I overcame. When I passed you, I just... And under my breath, I said, eat my dust. <laughs> but now my flesh... I mean, nobody likes to think that somebody got the upper hand on them. Especially a woman. <laughs> Boy, there's all that male ego coming up right there and chauvinism and stuff, amen. I, 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 it, n nobody, nobody likes for somebody to do something evil towards you. And it appear like you're, you're, you're rendered helpless. You want to retaliate. I find most of my counseling with marital problems starts with uh, small artilleries where it starts and then it gets into the heavy artillery. He said something she didn't like, just said it. And so, you know, uh, you know the proverbial statement, we don't get mad, we just get even. Now that's a lie. You don't want to get even. You want to get just a little up on them. You want the last word. Well, yeah. oh, some of you is kind of going. <laughs> you, you, you hate, you know, and, and then, you know, it just starts off with some little problem and then something said and then, you know, you've got to say something to really dig at them and, you know, boom. And, you know, they start with a pea shooter and then you pull a 22 and they pull a 38 and then you pull a cannon and they pull a bazooka. And then you go to the nuclear armament and you start pulling stuff out of their past. You know, everybody situations, there's one little area right there, there's a little red button. You know, you say, boy, if I push that one, I'm going to blow you away. And then it ends up in the pastor's office. But I mean, Paul told the church at Rome, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, don't recompense to no man evil for evil. That even includes your companion or a brother or sister in the church. And he said, if they do you evil, he said, don't pay them back with evil. Stay with me now. He said, provide things that are honest in the sight of all men, live above reproach, is what he said, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you. He said, live peaceably with all men. Then he says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. He is quoting from Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, I believe the 25th verse, when God told them, He said, there's a point in the time that you are not to render back to your enemy, but you are to allow me to serve and to vindicate your cause or an injustice. Man. Now that's hard for us. Oh, it's quiet now. It's hard for us. He said, but I tell you what, if you will leave a place for God's wrath, you remember one thing. Vengeance is the Lord's. The Amplified Version says, if you will just leave a place open and not allow anything else in there, there is a point and a time that the God of vengeance arrives and God says, I'm going to vindicate the cause. I'm going to prove what's right here. I'm going to pay them what they got coming to them. Now the world thinks it's getting by. Sin thinks it's getting by. Iniquity thinks it's getting by. It's kind of like God gets pleasure, and I, I hate to use that, maybe incorrect, out of it appearing that the enemy is getting by. And God just lets him go, 
and go and go and go and go and go and he lets people keep doing things and doing things and doing things and doing things and hiding things and sneaking things and then this attitude begins to develop nothing's happened to me so you know God must think it's all right and I'm getting by with it and well you know this is all right I'm just a little bit different I'm telling you something tonight I don't care who you are where you come from even if you're the devil there's a day and an hour coming that God is going to serve vengeance on the world oh yes he is amen now, I'm, I want to say a couple of things here, and I hope you can understand what I'm about to say. God works in some very unusual ways to fulfill His divine purpose in all of us. The whole scenario of Christianity is for you to be like Him. Amen. That's it. To be like His image. To begin to develop His nature and his character oh yeah it's from glory to glory just about the time you get one thing mastered in your life and you say I am on my way I have succeeded in being a Christian all of a sudden the preacher gets up and he starts teaching a Bible study or preaching a sermon and God reveals something in your life again that is displeasing to him and the process begins one more time and God takes us from glory to glory and from victory to victory until the final victory when we awake in His likeness and in His image. Oh, hallelujah to God. Amen. In that process, not only does God show us things in His Word, but God allows things to happen in our lives that we don't understand to bring about God's divine purpose in us. I've often seen it happen. You got somebody over here, and then you got a devil over here. Somebody acting like a devil. This person's totally wrong. And they offend this one over here. Now, what? why would that happen? Why would God allow that to happen? God wants you to see the nature of this individual to deal with that. And at the same time, he begins to reveal something in this one over here that he wants eradicated or moved out. So he has to use two objects, two opposites. He's teaching this one the sin that they have. You're wrong for your lying tongue. You're wrong for your gossiping. You're wrong for your backbiting. You're wrong for your cheating. And you're wrong for your offense. And to this one that has been offended, I'm teaching you the ability to forgive. Oh, oh, oh. Boy, that's a hard lesson to learn because I'm telling you, when we are wronged, when we are wronged, there's something in all of us. It's called human nature that we want to be vindicated and we want God to prove us right. Stay with me now. Amen. I mean, and, and so we start to stuff out to you what? I'll just go give them a piece of my mind. Bless God, they've lied on me. They've cheated and said stuff and backbiting, gossiping, reprobate. And while you're spewing off, God's going, hey, 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 you hear what you're saying? I was hanging on a cross. They were putting the spirit in my side. And I said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Somebody has got to be used to fulfill God's divine purpose. They're wrong for doing it, but they've got to do it to bring about this. Oh, here we go. Amen. Sons of God come one day before the throne of God, and God got to look at them, and He seen the old trespasser, and, and He said, What are you doing, Satan? He said, Oh, I've been out to and fro. 
And God said, to and fro. He said, yeah. He said, have you considered my servant Job, which allows us the insight to know in Satan's going to and fro, his objective is to find people to test and to try, to destroy. And so Satan said, I couldn't touch him with a ten-foot pole. you got a hedge about him, and you know you won't let me touch him. So God said, all right, tell you what. He said, I'm going to remove that hedge. And he said, I'll let you at him. He, and Satan said, all right. He said, let me touch his flesh. Let me touch his body. Let me touch his physical man. And God said, absolutely not. He said, you can touch him, but don't kill him. You ever heard the story? And so he said, all right, I'll do it. I like this. Job, Job just minding his own business, just doing his own thing. And all of a sudden, he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry. But the diagnosis said, you've got this terminal disease. It's eaten through your body. <laughs> And Satan said, watch this, he'll curse you now to your face, and he'll die. And so Job come home from the doctor's office and said, honey, you're not going to believe the report. I mean, this is a man, Brother Clark, paid his tithes, faithful to the church, loved God. Couldn't put your finger on him. He comes back from the doctor. I'm going to preach this church tonight now. And, and, and he said, honey, you're not going to believe this. But he said, I, I've got this disease. And, and his wife looked at him and said, some God you serve, why don't you curse him and die? Now, where did she hear that from? Oh, I'm surprised sometimes at who can become the mouthpiece of the adversary. Glory. And so Satan went back before the throne. He said, didn't work. He said, I'll tell you what, though. He said, you let me take his children. He said, and I'll tell you what. He said, he'll curse you this time. And so he just, he just gets back home from the doctor's office, and he's sitting there, and the phone rings, and somebody says, you're not going to believe this, but all your kids were coming home for Thanksgiving, and they had a terrible car wreck, and they all killed. God have mercy. And he hangs the phone up. And while he's sitting there in that stupor, another phone call comes. And they said, we're sorry, but your job just fell through. Your retirement's out the window. You're broke. And Job's wife looked at him and said, best thing you can do, honey, is die. Yeah. Or some comfort she was. <laughs> Sounded to me like she wanted somebody else. We got quiet there, didn't it? Amen. I want to show you something. And while Job is going through all of this, all of it, it appears, Brother Clark, in our sight, that the enemy is having his complete way. There's only one little area that God is going to deal with in Job. Now, I, when I say this, some of you are going to disagree, and you, you have the right to disagree. But you begin to sense about Job when you study this, this book out. There is an almost a spiritual pride that has engulfed him. In the 42nd chapter, he talks about these things. He said, the only thing that I really knew about God is what I heard. And he said, what I heard was so wonderful. He said, I spoke it everywhere I went. I talked about the wonderful works of God. I talked about the things of God. He said, but that's all that I knew about God. It's just what I heard. He said, and when I was going through all of this, he said, when I needed God the most, I looked before me, he wasn't there. To the right, he wasn't there. Behind me, he wasn't there. But when I turned and looked at the left, he said, he was doing a work there that I knew not of. Whoo! Where are you at when I need you, God? I'm dying. My kids just got killed. I'm busted. I'm broke. Everything I've worked for just went out the window. But when Job surmised it all, he made the statement, Naked came I into the world. Naked I'm going to leave. But there's one thing that I refuse to do. 
I refuse to charge God foolishly. Woo. Hear me now. I'm going to show you something. What God was really doing in the life of Job was He allowed it to happen. He permitted it to happen. When you get into the third chapter of the book of Job, God says to Satan, He said, the only regret I have is I have allowed you and you have caused me to move against Job. Without cause. Where you at, God? I'm doing the best I know how. Come on now. If I was a worldly person, maybe I could understand it. If 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 I wasn't trying to live right, I, I could I, I maybe could understand some of this stuff. But God, I I don't know. I, I I'm having a hard time comprehending this. I don't understand. I, I, I'm just trying to live for you. I'm trying to do the best I know how. And all this hell breaks loose on me. And, and, and when I need you the most, when, when I call on your name, I, I can't sit you. I go to prayer meetings and you're not there. I, I sit there on a Sunday night where everybody's rejoicing. And it's like you're not there. And I look for you and I probe for you and I can't find you. And all I can see in the distance somewhere, you're doing a work, I guess. That's all I can say. I don't even know what the work is. But you're doing something in my life. And so when nothing else makes sense, we quote that verse of Scripture. All things work together for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. But it just don't make sense, God. Nothing makes sense right now. Woo, hallelujah to God. I don't understand it, God. And sometimes we're like the psalmist David. When I look at the prosperity of the wicked, my foot well nigh slipped when I knew I was trying to do right, when I knew my heart was right towards you, and it looked like you wasn't nowhere to be found. And I got to looking at people that weren't even trying to live right, and they're blessed here, and they're blessed there, and they're blessed over here. Don't make sense, God. And what God was saying is, Job, there's a little place. If you can keep it open, if you can keep the door of it open, and you don't allow bitterness to sit in, and your own vindication to sit in, and evil to sit in that place, if you can just keep it open, honey, there's a day coming that the avenge is going to arrive. And it may not have made sense then, but in that day, in that hour, it's all going to come together. Glory. Because here's what happens. When evil comes and we don't understand it, when things like this start transpiring, and, and when God starts working in these areas, now listen to me, when God removes from us negative factors, a lot of times to get our attention and to get it out, He also has to remove positive things. Hello? Come here. Let's suppose you're just kind of walking along and I say, All right, there's something in you that I'm going to get out. But I can't get it. I can't gain your attention until I remove positive things out of your life that you're attached to. So he reaches in like he did Job. He pulls it all out because all Job could say was, I've only heard of God. I've only heard about His miracles. I've only heard about the revival. And God said, uh -uh, Job, I want you to see it. Because the way you look at it is the prosperity of your own hand. But there's three things that God refuses to share with man. Number one is His glory. And when he disfigured Job with boils, there was no way that Job wanted to go into the presence of God and try to glory in his sickness and in his infirmity. So God said, I'll take care of that. He said, number two, there's something else I'm not going to share with you. That's my wealth or my money. He said, first fruit belongs to me. Don't touch it. It's mine. If you touch it, I'll kill you. I'll curse you. We get this concept because God blesses us. It's mine. 
I'm going to preach now. It's mine. I did it. I had a man look at me one time. Uh, God have mercy. I don't even mind it being a public example because I'll tell you how, how strong I felt about it. I'll tell, I'm going to tell it to you right here. They, they had a piece of property and a store come into town. Walmart come in to buy them out. And so they had this little old plot of ground and Walmart paid them 200 and something thousand dollars for that little piece of property. And so they, they uh, were blessed. <clears throat> Needless to say. Piece of property probably worth fifty thousand dollars. They get two hundred and sixty something thousand for it. And so, boy, I got a devil corner right now. Mm -mm. He 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 thinks he's getting mad. And when he gets mad, I'm gonna hit him again. And so he uh, a few months went by, and, and 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 they didn't give a dime to the church. No tithing, no offering, no nothing. And so this is just my nature. I said, I just leave it alone. I ain't worried about it. They can live with it. I can live without it. But I promise you one thing. It's going to be a whole lot better on me living without it than it is you living with it. There's a reason why Aiken got killed. It's because he took something belonged to God. So... So a few months went by, and I, I just, my wife said, honey, what, what do you think? She said, you think they're going to do anything? I said, I don't know. I said, they've been faithful up to this point. You know, they made, paid 40 bucks a week ties for years. But then they get this. Different story. And so it got to troubling me, and I went to prayer about it. And I really felt like God was dealing with me. And I, I talked to some of my pastor friends, and I asked them, I said, what would you do in a case like this? He said, Brother Morgan, he said, I really don't know what to taste, but for some reason I, I feel to tell you that these people need to be warned what they're doing. I said, yeah, but it appears that I'm after their money. He said, well, he said, they don't understand biblical principles. All right. He said, they just have to think what they think. So I, I, I was in turmoil about it. So Brother Bourne come preach for me. And I took him to this little hole-in-the-wall Chinese restaurant we got there in Oak Mogan. Well, just past it was the property. So I sat there and something said, take him by there and just, just drive him by there. So we pull in. We're going down the road. And we come right to the place to the left where the property was. Now, they'd already moved the homes out of there. And four or five little trailers they had back there. They'd already moved all that out of there. And uh, so... Uh, we, we get right to where the property was, and that crazy brother Moore said, Stop the car. I said, Sir? He said, Whose property is that right there? I went, oh. He said, I see a massive building going across this place. He said, You going to build a church here? I said, mm -mm. He said, Well, I know that that piece of property. It's got something to do with your church. I said, yes, sir, it does. He just kind of shook his head. He said, all right, let's go. So I started to put foot back on the gas and take off. He said, hold it just a second. I said, yes, sir. He said, if the man will do what is right with that and pay to God what belongs to God, his wife will live. If he doesn't, she will die. And then you want to ask if there's prophets in our world right now? Oh, you probably told him right. I'm not even going to fool with you tonight. You wouldn't believe it. If Jesus Christ himself walked into the building and said it to you, you wouldn't believe it because your heart is full of unbelief and that's why your mind is evil. I said, Brother Born, I said, man, I was weeping. I was weeping. I said, Brother Born, you don't understand. He said, well, from what I just felt and all that stuff, he said, I'm going to assume the rest of it. Now, God didn't tell me this. I'm going to assume. He said, apparently somebody sold some property didn't pay tithes on it, did they? I said, something like that. He said, 
older couple? I said, yeah. He said, son, you mark it down. And he, and he took out a piece of paper and he wrote it. And he dated it. August the 2nd, 1992. So, called the family in and I told them. And I was so sincere in what I was saying to them. I said, in order for you to know that I am not after your money, if you, do, if you do this, I will give every penny of it to the church. I said, I don't want your money. The man looked at me. And he started getting red in the face. And he leaned up on his chair and his wife was already diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And with her over there with her hands shaking, I seen her healed one night at a healing service. And she was progressing and doing better until they got their money. And when they got their money and didn't give to God when it started, she went downhill. And the man of God didn't know she had any disease. So he got red in the face, and this is what he said to me, Mr. Clark. He said, I'll have you know I have worked hard all of my life. And he said, I will not give a preacher a dime of it. He said, I have worked. He said, you see these hands? I said, yes, sir. He said, I have worked many hours with these hands. He said, I'm going to have to quit my job to take care of my wife. And he said, I have. I said, here's what I can't understand. He said, I have right at $100,000 left for our retirement. He said, even if I pay on that, that means I'm going to give to you $10,000? I said, sir, that's where you're wrong. You ain't giving to me nothing. It's God's. All of it's His. Maybe there's a little something about Job we've never seen. How could Job talk about a God he has seen with maybe his attitude was, boy, I really made a right business deal here and did this right. And look at my oxen and look at my family. and I've done pretty good, haven't I? Oh, I come to church. Give, faithful. No real sin in my life. Every preacher from that point on that I had would stop somewhere in their sermon and say, God killed Sanballat and Tobiah because they lied about their finances. Are you any better? Or another one would come and say, I feel to say something somebody in this church said, you're withholding on God. You don't whittle everything off of it. Well, let's deduct taxes and let's deduct this and let's deduct that. And, well, look, I don't have anything left. Church owes me money. God said, Job, when you start thinking it's yours, when you get tight-fisted with it. He said, you expect me to give you that kind of money? He said, have you ever worked? I said, sir, normally I wouldn't even answer that kind of a question. I said, I know what it's like to hold a public job. I know what it's like to get up and go to work. I know what it's like to lay on the floor and pray for your wife because she's sick for hours. I know what it's like to call your name before God. I know what it's like to lose sleep because of this dumb situation we're dealing with right now. And I said, now you keep your money because now I'm going to tell you a story. And I told him what the man of God said. And his wife sitting there listening to it. 
I'm going to show you what money does to people, Brother Clark. If that was me, and my wife was sitting next to me, and she was dying, and a man of God would have said it, whether I even thought there might be a little chance, I'd have said, if you'll wait, I'll write you a check. I'll tell you what he did do. He went and bought one of his boys a new three-bedroom, two-bath home. And he went and bought another one a truck and a trailer to rodeo all around the country. And he looked at me and he said, nothing. Hmm. I watched him come in. I mean, every preacher, every preacher for over a year that preached for us, Brother Clark, would say something about it. One night, Brother Guy Gollum covered a broken arrow. He said, this is not my style of preaching. But he said, he didn't know anything about the situation, so he went to preaching about it. And, and he, he preached so hard on finances. I'm going to tell this church, like I told mine a couple nights ago, if we ever get the right attitude about our finances, God will rain upon us. I'll tell you what God will do. You may have a negative attitude about your money. And so God will reach in and in order. He don't want your money. He doesn't need your money. But he wants your attitude right. And so what he can do is he can reach in and take the positive and extract it. And he, oh, listen to me now. He can allow the enemy to come in and strip you of everything and then watch your response. If Job would have got bitter, if Job would have accused God, if he would have filled that place that only wrath should have filled, I hope I haven't lost you, that he would have never seen the vengeance of God because he'd have tried to have vindicated his own self. But God said, Job, son, I'm doing something. And if you'll just wait. He said, there's something else I won't share, and that's my vengeance. And when I took your children, you had a chance to shake your fist in my face and the devil's face. But Job, you didn't. You left that spot open. Therefore, the avenger is going to arrive. And he's going to feel that place. And when the avenger arrived, he said, Job, I extracted what I needed to extract. But now it's payday. What did you lose, Job? Let's calculate it up. What did you lose, Job? You lost your children? How many? I'll give you seven times as many. Your wealth? You lost your wealth? I'll give you seven times as much as you started with. Because Job, when it's payday in God's economy, I just don't pay you back what you lost. I start adding interest to it. <laughs> Job, you kept your spirit right. Job, you didn't let bitterness get in your heart. Come on now. Job, when I stripped you down of everything and you were laying there shamed in your own sight, you could have said, what did you do it to me for, God? What are you doing, God? What did I do to deserve this? But no, Job, you just simply said, hey, woman, I'm going to tell you something. I refuse to charge God foolishly. I don't understand what he's doing, but I'm going to wait to see the ultimate outcome of this. And when he come finally down through the portals of Job's heart, the Bible says that Job said then, I only heard about him before, but now mine eyes have seen him. I'm not just going to preach about God's miraculous provisions. I have seen it. Because in a moment's time, God gave me back everything plus the interest on it. When God looked, I, no, I don't need to get off this just yet. I, I, I want to head to a positive area.
you know, I can pretty well deal with certain things. I just kind of got that nature, just kind of brush it off. But now my little darling, she, she, she gets bothered by things from time to time. Broken promises. You know, I mean, here we are starving to death, giving about everything we got to the work of God. And uh, can't hardly pay your bills. I'm just going to work on this while I'm here. And then people come to church bragging about, hey, remember that old house I bought over here? I sold that the other day made $30,000 on it. Can you believe that? I've heard them say it. And, 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 and you get to thinking, well, man, they, they're blessed. Surely they'll bless the work of God. Nope. Nope. Hey, Pastor, come out and show you my new car. Paid cash for it. It's nice. Just hope I can make my payment this month. I know what it's like for money to be so tight. Little old lady come in one time, a little henpecked husband beside her. She said, we're leaving. I said, you are? I said, yeah. I said, well, like tell me why. PA's too loud. PA's too loud. Hmm. I said, is that the only reason? Well, you know, it's just so loud around here. Everything's always just going. I said, okay. She said, I, now watch her, watch her. She says, I hate to do it, Pastor, because I know you need our money. A little hint packed, that's what they're going. So I said, so that's what you're leaving over. She said, yeah, I, I want to find me a church with things a little quieter. I said, well, yeah, there's probably a few around here. <laughs> so she's talking. So I hope you're not offended. <laughs> I said, are you sure it's because PA's too loud? She said, mm-hmm. I said, are you sure it doesn't have anything to do because you've got television in your living room? She said, well, I, 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 and I looked over him, he's going. <laughs> I said, you come up here telling me you're leaving because you're leaving because of loud music. But I said, apparently that loud TV ears don't bother you at all. And I said, I have more respect for you if you just come up here and tell me the truth. But I said, you come up here and tell me you're leaving over loud music. I said, that's not the issue. They said, the issue's over the television because I got up the other night and preached against them. She said, well, so, <laughs> grabbed her purse up and off she went. Now, I, I felt like I did what was right. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something, Brother Clark. I, I'm going to be honest. When I went home, I said, what were the so-and-so's talking to you about? I said, they're leaving. And, oh, they gave. Oh, they paid good time. And I was already, I was going under then. So we're sitting there, she said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. I said, I said, it don't seem fair. And at that point, it looks like the enemy has gotten the upper hand. Another empty spot, Brother Clark. Of course, I know people in Austin don't change churches. <laughs> you know, I'm a pre. <laughs> I'm surely not over loud PAs, anyhow. 
probably wasn't PH, probably TV. <laughs> See, they're all the same everywhere. <laughs> it, I, I, I'm like, and I'm up here preaching revival, I'm preaching souls, I'm preaching harvest, I'm preaching we're going to grow. And <laughs> Brother Morgan, you know, so-and-so told me to tell you they ain't coming back. <laughs> Why don't they come tell me? Oh, they said you wouldn't understand. Everybody in my area is having revival for a while. God, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. And uh, I, I would, I'd go home, I'd say, I would say, okay, God, if you'll just tell me where I'm wacko at, you know, and then I, here, here, here's the kicker. Then my buddies would call me. Oh, Morgan. Oh, my God, man. We had church tonight. Got $26,000 in the offering, 150000 this week in tithing, and boy, God's blessing. And and then you go off to meetings and stuff. And here's this guy. Now, now I probably, should, this is where I'm going to get in trouble. Here's this guy, you know, don't preach nothing. Fat meat ain't even greasy. <laughs> Carnal. Brags about going to the ball games and watching R-rated movies. I was never so disillusioned in all my life. I was with some of the quote-unquote big shot preachers. And brother, I could really do some damage right here. And I was a young preacher. And these guys were my heroes. And, and, and so I it was at this deal. I'm embarrassed to even tell you where he's at. He's at a golf tournament of all places. And I'm sitting there. and Man, these are heroes. These are big shots, you know. And I heard one of them go, Hey, Bo, we're going to go to the movies and go to the ball game. Are you going with us? And the other said, What are you getting? And he starts rounding off all these movies. And I'm going, I'm down here in Oklahoma trying to preach and have revival. People leaving. I don't care whether you like this guy preaching or not. It's truth anyhow. I, I, I'm just, <laughs> Brother Clark, I'm just, I was just doing it the way they told me, the way I was raised. I mean, I was preaching against things and things. My pastor showed me the book and, and I, I said, man, it's in there. I see it. And I, I just get up and preach it and, 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 and oh my God, have mercy. And here it goes. And, and, and then stripped to this and stripped to that and. Until last Saturday night. When God said, Son, the Avenger's coming. If you'll just keep your spirit right, when I get through, when I'm finished, it's going to be a different story. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you something here, Brother Clark, by the help of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you what's fixing to happen here. I thought that old devil, people being so stingy, trying to do a work for God. I've had them get so mad at me. They can't pass the church and be gone all the time. Well, I'm doing it. And they wanted to control. And they start putting pressure on you. And you, you, you're killing yourself. Every dime I was making, I was coming back keeping the church afloat. I was putting thousands of dollars into the church. Never, 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 never anything less than 2000 a month back into it. And then you got people sitting in the church because God does bless you something. And they start, boy, living pretty high, aren't you? Oh boy, oh boy. 
I wouldn't even show them the books. I wouldn't even show them where in, in one month's time, without my knowledge, they borrowed out of the account I had $5,000 to pay church bills. And the secretary come to me and said, I hope you don't mind we had to borrow this. I said, well, whether I do or not, it's done, isn't it? I never said one thing about it. But see, I'd set that aside and said, nah, that's what I'm going on vacation on and that's our Christmas. And they come to me the first of December last year and told me that. And I had to go home and say, honey, you know, I told you not to worry about Christmas? Yeah. Well, don't worry about it, yeah. She said, that ain't right. I said, no, you're right, it ain't right. And boy, it looks like, are y'all still with me now? It, it looks like the enemy is getting the upper hand. Two days before Christmas, one of the men in church called, said, you going to be home for a while? I said, yeah. He said, I'll come by there. I need to come by there for a little bit. They got behind on some tithing. And uh, I, I told my dad, I said, you got any money? He said, yeah. I said, you got enough for your tithing? He said, yeah. I said, bring me the check. He said, if I do that, I, I don't have enough. I said, just bring it. So they brought me the check. I said, all right, is this your tithe? I said, you figure up all your back tithe. Yeah. I said, this is the amount. Yeah. I said, all right. Shh. I said, don't get behind them again. I don't do that to everybody. If you're behind, you pay them up. Oh, God, there's that sick feeling in the pit of my stomach again. Well, I need them worse than he does. It's not that you need them worse than he does. It's that God says, it's mine. Don't touch it. That's the bottom line. So he, he, he come up to the house, him and his wife, they walked in. I thought, oh God, I wonder what's wrong. Marital problems, divorce, kids messing up, what? He walked in and said, well, the morning he said, when I started getting my social security, he said they misfigured it. He said, uh, they sent me a check the other day for $22,000. He said, so I thought, he said, you might could use the tithing off of it here. And he said, remember that? Five hundred something dollars that I was behind on, you gave back to us. Yes, sir. He said, I won't pay that back to you also. He said, I won't give you another five hundred dollars just for a Christmas present. <laughs> anyhow, 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 anyhow. Now I got a long ways to go in a short time to get there, so hang on here. So I just I just keep dealing with this, keep dealing with it, just keep dealing with it, keep dealing with it, keep dealing with it, keep dealing with it. I mean, God is never gonna break. I mean, just about time you say, this is it. Boy, you get pulpit church, we're... <laughs> church, we're... In... <laughs> Boy, you, you, you almost hate to go back out there. I'm, I got to tell them, this is it, we're having revival. And then we come back the next service and all hell's broke loose and it's tighter than an eight-day clock and nothing's going on, people's backsliding. <laughs> I'm having fun tonight. <laughs> so, I, 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 just, I just kind of thought, we had this deal we called Harvest Fest, and, and, and so Sunday night was, last night was wanting to take an offering to kind of bought some new property, was going to pay it off and get ready to build in spring. Who was going? And, and I kept thinking, boy, I need to bring somebody in real missions minded. And, and the Holy Ghost, I was praying, the Holy Ghost said, bring your own born back in. I said, well, now, Lord, he's not quite what you have for one of these meetings. He said, who's running this church, Mary? I said, okay, God, I'll bring Jerome Bourne back in. And then, so Brother Bourne comes in and he preaches. I, I may see him tell us because he may have to come back here and preach the same thing. I don't know. He preaches on when God gives you a ringside seat. He said, we've got Jehoshaphat up on the side of the mountain. He said, now, you just sit there and praise me. While you praise me, you watch because I'm fixing to bust hide out here. So, man, I mean, we had, and, and toward the end, he starts talking about money. So my, I went home, and I said, what do you think? I said, I think by tomorrow night, it'll be broke. Spirit. So, come back the next night. He said, I'm going to preach against unbelief tonight. And dear God, did he ever start in on it? And he started in. 
and Brother Clark, I'm telling you, it was a rehearsal for the last six months of what I preached to the church. I had told them there's only one thing that separates us from real apostolic revival, and that's our attitude about giving. He hauled off, he said, there's only one thing that separates this church from apostolic revival. It's giving. See, they, back in the fall, they said, oh, we're going to send you PSR. We're going to give you a, a vacation offering, all this stuff. Yeah, what are you going to do? Go up and remind them? Uh, yeah, y'all said you're going to take an offering for them. Would you hurry and get the job done? I'm fixing to leave. And nothing materialized. I don't blame them. People get... You know, nobody wants to take the response, but whatever, whatever. I, but but it, it kind of bothered my wife a little bit. <laughs> she said, this is the beatenest bunch I've ever seen in my life. She said, I'm telling you, she said, they'd let you support them. She said, I'm surprised they don't want you paying their utility bills. And I hate to tell her, I already paid two or three for them that week. So, I said, honey, there is a God in heaven. She said, right. I said, God will take care of it. Just, just, and this is what I told her. I said, don't get a bad attitude about it. I said, it ain't worth being lost over. I said, God take care of it. She said, okay. So, boy, born, you know how it gets when he's, because I feel something. Before he started down that center aisle, he walked up to one of them. He said, sir. Holy Ghost told me to challenge you. Boy, this guy's eyes got about that big. He said, he said, I don't even know what I'm going to challenge you over, but I'll be back. So he kept preaching. I fixed, I'm fixing to hit it right here. He kept preaching. And while he's preaching, I'm still on the platform. The Holy Ghost said, I'll show it to you now. Boom. And on one side to the left, I seen an old tree that was stripped. Mr. Clark, barren and stripped. He said, what I plan to do with others that would not allow me, I will strip them. And then to the right, he showed me a green tree with foliage and fruit. He said, now this is what I'm about to do with people that will believe me. He said, I'm fixing to bless you, and I'm fixing to bless this church. He said, you walk to the pulpit when he's doing decree, and if you have to, even call their names. He said, because I'm going to show death, and I'm going to show life. So we're born, he, he cuts back through. He says, I don't know what it is now. He said, somebody else should have done this. He said, God dealt with you to do it. He said, somebody in this church was supposed to have done it, and you didn't do it. He said, therefore, God's going to strip you. He said, but to you, sir, he said, I challenge you, because if you'll do what I'm about to ask you to do, he said, God will bless you. The guy said, all right. He said, will you do it? He said, yes, sir. He said, go buy your pastor a new car. I said. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of thinking. Ooh, this is going to get interesting. He said, if you don't do that, he said, go get his payment book and make the payments on his car until it's paid off. He said, and if you will do it, he said, sir, Holy Ghost says, he'll prosper you a hundredfold. So Brother Boren walked back and said, you got something to say to this church. He said, yes, sir. So I told him, Brother Clark, the Holy Ghost moved through there. And I felt something go, snap. And God said, I have finished it. And said, because they will now believe and do what I ask them to do. That's when he gave me the message. I am now not ashamed to be called their God. And when I'm not ashamed of my people, I show myself mighty on their behalf. <sighs> Seth Church, his wife woke up. My wife said, I'm supposed to come get the payment book. Would you bring it in the morning? Oh, I said, and now you, I don't like stuff like that. I don't like anybody thinking they got one on me. So I want to go. And the Holy Ghost said, don't touch him. Don't touch him. 
let him do it. I'm going to bless him. So his wife left. My wife walked up to me. She said, three years ago, when we were giving you fits, well, my husband won't leave this church. You stopped one night and said, Holy Ghost says, before it's all said and done, you'll be one of the strongest supporters of the ministry of this church. I walked in Sunday morning. There's people in this church right now that could pay you out of debt. Well, he's got put in money. I'm going to tell you something about Brother and Sister Clark. If they, church secretary, very fun about to say, if you ever stop and put it all together, how much they've given to Austin Tabernacle, you'd shut your mouth. And not just Austin Tabernacle, but other places. I don't care whether you like it or not. And some of you, if you're not careful, I feel the same thing I felt on Mogi Saturday night right here. God's going to strip you. And he's going to reach over and find him somebody else. He's going to use them because they'll believe it and do it exactly. See, God gave you a chance to do it and you wouldn't do it. And so God said, all right, if you won't do it, that's fine. I'll strip you, I'll make you bare, but I'll find me somebody that will. Because I'm fixing to vindicate some things in this church. I walked in Sunday morning, right at 10 o'clock, and I said it from my office. And when I walked, turned the hallway there, you know what I'm talking about? The man was standing there, another man in the church. Now, you'd have to know these two men. I fought with them, and they'd given me fits for years. <laughs> they stand there, I thought, oh, boy. So I said, come in. They said, we need to talk to you. I said, well, come in. I'm in a hurry. I said, all right. So they walked in. So the man said, Brother Morgan, I, 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 I don't want to do what I said last night about your car. And the devil said, see there? I thought you said it was broke. Same old thing. You get your hopes built up. And this is what happens. He said, no, sir. He said, this brother here has been talking to me about it. And I thought, yeah. He said, no, sir. He said, uh, I want you to keep that Mercury you got. He said, well, what kind of car do you want? You want a Lincoln? You want a Cadillac? A conversion van? What do you want? I said, why? He said, because we're going to get it for you. I want to say, not. <laughs> and one of them sitting over there looked at me and said, we finally woke up and realized what you'd done for us. And this is just a small way of showing you we appreciate you. So, I said, well, you know, I got these three kids. One of them looks like he's going to grow up to be a pretty good size. Of course, smallness runs in our family. <laughs> I said, you know, and I don't want to. I said, I've been looking at full-size conversion bins. I said, okay. What, what kind do you want? I suppose I don't need anything just real elaborate. I would like something nice. I said, all right. I said, I'll talk to you some more about it tonight. <laughs> so, got to church. He said, you go pick this Ford dealership. I said in the morning, I said, there's a green van over there. Why don't you look at it? Tell me what you think about it. And I said, Whew. I said, well, all right. So I drove over there today and got out. And the guy said, you Pastor Morgan? See, I've been expecting you. I'm supposed to show you this van. And, and how long I'm kind of going? I kind of felt like Peter coming out of the prison. Because I was so used to appearing like the devil was getting the upper hand about everything. He said, okay. He said, uh, your man from the church said he'd be in about 5.30, 5.45. said, uh, we'll take care of everything. And So he called me and said, Brother Morgan, if you don't like this, and I've, I've called up to us, place up there, go up there and look. I said, whatever. So we got the car, and I told my wife about it. I said, remember the vacation? Mm-hmm. So remember all the times? Uh, I said, God just wants you to know that when he repays, he pays 
with interest. But Clark, God wants you to know that when he pays, he pays with interest. All the times you and Sister Clark have left the church. And it looked like the devil had the upper hand. God just wants you to know that vengeance is his. It's here right now. Let's pray that God will do what he wants to do in this place tonight. You pray with me right now. I got. I haven't even got to where I really want to go, but I feel a moment that we need to stop right here. Let's pray. Join someone close to you. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray. The will of God be done right now. Telling Austin Tabernacle the Avenger is about to arrive. Come on, let's pray. Lift your voice and pray. Come on, you need to ask the Holy Ghost to speak to you. Individually speak to you right now. Speak to you. Speak to you. I told the church last night we got ready to take the offering. I said, I need, I said, we owe $16,000 on the property. I said, I, I, I want us to at least take that in the back of my mind. I know some of them, I know they don't have any money. And young married couples, and of course there's some there that could give it all. And uh, I watched them people bring their offering and lay it there, weeping and crying. I watched Sunday morning. I watched Sunday morning as God healed six people, miraculously healed them in front of the church, visible miracles, healed them. And while we was praying for the sick, young lady been coming to church her third time there, so tattered and torn by sin. We was praying for the sick, God, the family that had been bringing them. So I heard somebody talking in tongues, looked down, there she was, hands in the air, tears streaming down her cheeks, talking in tongues, magnifying God. Charismatic couple come in the service last night. She's kind of scattered in the head, but he to find out he, he at one time felt a call to preach. He went to a seminary. They left the service last night, told the same couple that brought the other lady, told them, said, I've been to a lot of churches, but I've never been to something like this. He said, for the first time, I feel like I found a place. He said, we're hungry. He said, I'm hungry for what's real. And the last few weeks, I've watched God baptize people. And I've watched those empty spots start filling up. And a few weeks ago, I watched them start bringing out phone chairs by the clerk, set them down. Sunday night, last night, I looked across there, and it was packed. And I could hear, I could hear God say, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The devil never gets by, son. He never gets by. And if you'll just keep the place open for my wrath, I'll repay. Israel, I will restore unto you the years, the years, the 
with the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar have eaten. I sent them among you to eradicate, to remove things that need to be removed, but I had to take the good with it. I had to get your attention, and so after I gained it, I just want you to know that in one moment's time, I'm going to give you back the years that you lost. Mm, I feel a mighty touch of the Holy Ghost in this place right now. Every day the judge could set his watch by her. Every day he knew she'd be there. Apparently somewhere along the lines her adversary had taken something from her that meant value. Every day he knew at the same time she'd show it. He knew the words she would say. She'd look at him and say, Sir, avenge me of my adversary. Finally he told him, he said, I can't take it any longer. So she's wearing me out. And finally that one day, I don't know how many years perhaps she'd come saying the same thing, avenge me. But one day the judge said, it's done. I'm going to give you back everything your adversary took from you. And Jesus said, if he knows how to do that, how much more shall your heavenly Father avenge his own elect, which cry unto him day and night, though he bear long with them. Oh, it's time for Austin Tabernacle to ask the avenger to avenge. Oh, come on, follow the Holy Ghost with me right now. Woo! He said, and I'm telling you when I do it, I'll do it speedily. Everything you lost, I'll give back to you in a moment's time. Hallelujah. Oh, what is it, disciples? Houses, lands, mothers, fathers? What is it you gave me? Tell me. What is it that you gave me? But I'll make you a promise now. I don't care what it is you've given me in this life. In this life, I'll give you back a hundredfold. And we won't even talk about the next life to come. I'm not preaching something just to stir your emotions to hype you up. I'm telling you what the Holy Ghost spoke to me a week ago Saturday night. He said, you tell them the Avenger is coming. You tell them to keep the way open. You tell them to keep their heart right. Don't become bitter. Don't try to vindicate themselves. Just keep a right spirit. And I'm going to walk among them. And when I walk in that place, I'm going to restore everything. There was a visitor in the service Saturday night. He walked up to me. He said, Pastor Morgan. I said, yes, sir. He said, almost two years ago, I met you. I said, yeah. I said, I remember. He said, when you turned and walked away from me, he said, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, I'm not a spiritual man. But I knew it was God. He said, the Lord said, that man will build a building in his city. And when he starts, you are to help him. He said, I don't know the amount. He said, where you come in. He said, okay, how much money it is? He said, you tell me, and I'll get it for you. See, here's where you're missing it. Master, we don't have enough. I mean, we got at least 10,000 people out here and we don't have nothing to feed them with. And, and find what's out here then. So they start their search and they come back and they said, 
found this little boy over here, and he's got five loaves and two fishes. And the master said, And the little boy could have said, what you need my lunch for? I thought ahead. I planned. And these other people thought it through. I'm talking to somebody in the Holy Ghost tonight. I planned my lunch. That's what he could have said. Should have brought your own. But he took, that would be the equivalent of you going to general conference with, let's say, Big Mac, Large Fry, Large Coke. And God says, give it to me. And I'll feed this entire general conference with it. And you go, how? How, Master? Can I feed and do so much with so little? And Jesus said, just put it in my hands. And he gave all that he had. And that's where the miracle worker took over. Because little is much when God is in.